I'm going to go back to a little bit of traditional way of doing things this morning. And I'm going to read the scripture right now before we even get started into the sermon. And we're going to go back to it and look at it as we go through a little bit. But our gospel lesson is Luke 2, 22 through 38. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, for which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then she was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple and worshipped night and day, fasting and praying, counting up to them at the very moment, coming up to them at that very moment. She gave things to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. May God bless the reading of this holy word. Well, we said Happy New Year. Christmas has come and gone, although we are still in the Christmas season in the Christmas church. In the Christian church, someone said the other day, Christmas is over. And I said, actually, it's just begun. We are still in the Christmas season as Christian churches. But we are looking to a new year. Two days, I think, right? We're two days away. And we will ring in at 2019. Christ has come, the Savior has been born, to make all things new, to make us new. And as we look for, forward to this new year and the things that God will have for us, I wonder, have any of you started making any New Year's resolutions? Have you thought about them? Raise your hand if you made your New Year's resolution. Yes, somebody's got a big hand back there. You want to share with us what it might be, or is it personal? All right. Good. That's good. Anybody else have any other ones that they want to share? We, uh, we a lot of times hear the same old New Year's resolutions of, I'm going to lose weight this year. I'm going to work out more this year. That's one of mine. I'm going to start working out. Um, I'm going to work out more. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to start eating right and be healthy. We usually get into about two weeks of that, and we've already thrown them out the window, right? Hopefully not. Hopefully we stick with the things that we say we're going to do this year. But you know what? <clears throat> How many of you don't want to change anything? Just Everything's perfect just the way it is. You're perfect just the way you are. Well, there's a lot of us that don't love change. Some people do. But a lot of people just really enjoy that consistency. They don't want change. They don't want things to get di to be different. They love the schedules and the to-do lists. And sometimes they add things to their to-do list just so they can check them off. I did that the other day. I was actually working on something already. But I added it to the to-do list just so when I was done, I could check it off. We love being on time. 
And they're always the first ones to remind you if you're not on time. But they love that consistency. Do you guys know anyone like that? Maybe you're like that. And then there's the change folks. They're the ones that love to make plans about three minutes before the plans are supposed to happen. And they uh, hold a deep conviction for the rules, but they are at best just suggestions. They're very diligent about making that to-do list just to turn around and lose it. But how many of you lean more towards that consistency? And how many of you like that change? I uh, personally am more of the one that likes to change. I like to change things up. I don't like things to, to stay the same. And I think it's funny that a lot of us, um, I've observed, end up marrying our opposites. I'm more of the, I like change. I like to do things that I've never done before. I don't want to go on vacation to the same place that I've already vacationed once. I want to do something different. I don't want to go to the same spot twice. I don't like to watch movies more than once because I already know what's happened. I already know how it's going to end. I know the story. Why should I watch it again? And my husband, David, is just the opposite. He will watch movies over and over and over and over again. And the same video clips, the same YouTube clips of those movies over and over and over again. So much so that he knows, like, all the words. And he sits there and recites them all the time. He'll just blurt out, be walking down the hall, and he'll just start reciting some movie. And it was really funny because he was doing it this morning, too, as we were getting ready. He just was going on a tangent reciting these movies. But he loves that, watching that same movie over and over again. I think that's funny. The only time that uh, some of us like change is when we desperately need it. We don't want to change. We want to be dependable. And we don't want to go through change because it's uncomfortable. It gets us out of our routines. It gets us out of the way things are, and sometimes change is really painful. Now, David and I are, are reversed when it comes to the change, when it comes to trucks and cars. See, I, I'm just the opposite then. I don't want change when it comes to my car. I buy my car the way that it is from the factory, and that's how it's supposed to be. But if you all have seen David's truck, you know that that is not the way that he is. He's got the red stripes that he's put on there. He's got to jack it up, jack it up, lower it down, add this, take this away. I don't know. He takes some stuff off, just put new stuff on. I don't get it. But he likes to change that up when it comes to his, his trucks and that. But see, I'm like, I'm like this. It is the way that it is. It looks good. It's not broke. Don't fix it. Just leave it alone. Right? Except for when something's wrong with my vehicle. If I get a flat tire on my van, then I'm going to mess with it. I'm going to take the time to go and fix that flat tire. And I'll make that effort to change it. The bad news is that we are all broken and we need to be fixed. Which usually requires that we make some changes. The good news is that Christ came into the world to help us make those changes to walk with us, to show us how to grow, to learn how to be different, and to learn the way that God wants us to live. That's what Christmas was all about. Jesus came to change things and to draw us closer to God. So God is a God of change, and uh, he's not really content just to leave us the way that we are. The scripture we read earlier says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. And this is the promise that we have in Christ, the promise for everyone. You don't have to be the same to God. In fact, God doesn't want us to stay the same. If we became a Christian and we accepted Christ, and then we just decided we were going to stay exactly the way that we were, then we're not living the way that Christ intended us to live. We are not living into that faith. So this is the, the new year coming up. Do you want to be a new you? Or are you happy just the way you are? 
What might be broken in your life that you need to fix? No matter where you are in your relationship with God, his desire is to draw you closer. You don't have to stay the same, but there are many of us that may stay the same to avoid that painful change. I remember when I was younger, yeah. I got a splinter. And I know most of you probably had a splinter. If you've lived at all, you've gotten one of these. And they are just these little bitty things. But they hurt so much. And they cause us so much pain. And I remember going to my father and saying, I got a splinter. It hurts. And my dad loved to play doctor. He was just, he'd get out his tweezers and he'd get out the needles and he'd start, you know, uh, putting it under the fire and pouring alcohol on it. And, Come here. Come over here. Get over here. And I'm, no, daddy, no. Don't do it. Don't do it. Just leave it alone. Oh, yeah, get over here. And I remember just protesting, no, daddy, don't, don't. Don't pull it out of my finger. And that's so silly. But that's how we are a lot of times. A lot of times we don't want God to touch it. We don't want God to touch our splinters and remove them because we're afraid that that might hurt more. But that splinter hurts so bad. And I know that if I got it out, I would feel better. But I still didn't want him to touch it. I just wanted him to leave it there. I wonder if this will be the year that we allow God to remove some splinters in our lives. Do we want to be different? Do we want a closer relationship with God? Do we want to draw closer to Jesus and know Jesus more? Do we need more peace, more joy, more confidence? Where do we need, where do you need a new life? Where do you need God to come in and remove splinters? Is it in your relationships? Is it in uh, a destructive habit? Is it in the fact that you watch the same movie over and over again for 30 years? If you want to be different, if we want to be made new and we want that new you, I have some encouragement that I'd like to share with you. One of those is to start with what you know. Do the good we already know that we're supposed to be doing. We have all come to church because you're sitting here today. You've heard the scriptures. You've heard the lessons. You've been to probably Bible studies and Sunday school where you learned about the golden rule. All of those things that we already know we're supposed to be doing. Let's start out with that this year. The scripture that we read earlier in uh, Luke 2, 22 through 23, said, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated. See, Mary and Joseph had no idea what the future held for their son. They've been told he was the Messiah, who would save the world, what do you do with that? Where do you go? You don't know what that means. Mary and Joseph didn't know what that meant. They didn't know what that meant for them or for Jesus. They didn't really know exactly what the future held, but they did know what God had already told them to do, and that was to follow the law. Just go on and do what you know you're supposed to be doing. So they took him to the temple, and they started there. We can follow that example by doing what we already know God asks of us, doing what we already know, what we've already learned. If we want to be different this year, we can start with what we know. We can start by using that rule of the golden rule. We can be kind to that mean person who drives us crazy. We know we shouldn't be angry at people. We know we shouldn't have road rage. We know all these things. We know we're supposed to love everybody. We can do something in our faith that we feel like God is calling us to do. I'm going to probably get this wrong, but I'm going, to, I'm going to use an example of geothermal energy. I should have had Mr. Brooks come up and talk to us. Do you know what geothermal energy is? Anybody besides Chad? Okay. So geothermal energy is actually um, 
an energy that is deep beneath the surface of the earth. And the earth is full of heat. So it's actually possible to tap into that heat at the, in the middle of the earth and convert it into something that we can use, like electricity. Did I get that right? All right. <laughs> we can be like that geothermal energy. God already has that, that stuff inside of us, that heat. The convictions that we hold, the passions that we hold, the gifts that God has given us. We can tap into that, those gifts beneath the surface, and turn those into something that God can use for his glory. We find these gifts from God deep inside our surface, under the pain that we've experienced, or the pride that we hold on to, or the comfort that we are so secure in. We can tap into these and ignite our lives so that we can be lights for Jesus in the world. We need to ask ourselves what's really important and what is the good that I should be doing that I already know. The next thing that we get from this scripture is that we can look for God to lead us. Watch for the new thing that God is doing in your life this year. When Mary and Joseph went to the temple to dedicate Jesus, they ran into two amazing people. The first one was Simeon. In verse 25 of our scripture, it says this. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. Simeon was righteous and devout. But how did he get that way? How did he have the patience to wait for God? All those years to wait for God to do this new thing that was promised. The text is clear that it says it was the work of the Holy Spirit. There's three ways in which the Holy Spirit worked in his life. It says that the Holy Spirit was on him, was on Simeon. And then it said that the Holy Spirit had revealed what was going to happen to him. And then it says it moved him. It's not enough to just have the Spirit upon us and hold on to it. For it to be revealed, we have to act on what God is doing. We have to act on what has been told to us. After we wait on the Lord and we wait on the Spirit, we then act on what God wants us to do. So Simeon looked for God to lead and he followed even though he had no idea what was coming. I love GPS. Do you all use GPS? I love it. I don't know what we did before GPS. Uh, ask for directions? Yeah, somebody said ask for directions. You know how I know that um, Moses didn't like to ask for directions? Can you guess? He wandered around the desert for 40 years. I told that to David last night. I was like, ah, he's ha, 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 ha. Where's that canned laughter at? Here it is. Okay. Do you know he actually has canned laughter up here? <laughs> That's funny. I should have had that Kathy cue it for me. No, ask for directions. Well, now we don't have to ask for directions. But you know, before we had GPS, even when you asked for directions, you were wandering around and you didn't really know where you were going and, 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 it was kind of scary. I remember being scared when I didn't know where I was going. I was going to some place for the first time. I remember being scared. What if I get lost? What if I wind up in the wrong place? What if I go three hours past where I'm supposed to turn? Well, now we have GPS, and we can just rely on that to take us exactly where we need to go, and it takes away all of our anxiety, and most of the time it's right. Sometimes it'll take you around the loop a couple times, but you eventually get there. But God is like relying on our GPS because he can take us places 
without that fear. If we're relying on the Lord and we're waiting for the Spirit and we're waiting for that Spirit to come upon us, to be revealed to us, we don't have to be afraid. We can just move forward into this new year, knowing that God is with us. So, as Kim talked about, you know, about that, that skin that comes off the snake, I'm encouraging us to grow a little bit this year, to be new and to lean into that, that plan and that hope that Christ has for us, that Christ has revealed to us, that plan of, of making all things new. After Joseph and Mary met Simeon, they encountered Anna. In verse 26, there was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then she was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple and worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. I look at that example of Anna. She and Simeon had that same thing in common, that they were both waiting for God to do something new for them. But while she was waiting, she just didn't sit still. She worshipped daily. She grew spiritually. She worked on her relationship with God. She seeked the Lord. She fasted. She prayed. She was persistent in her dedication. So we want to be new and different this year. We've got to commit to growing spiritually. I propose that actually, if we want to be new this year, a new you, a new year, that we actually have to take the emphasis off of you or us and put it back on Jesus. So I encourage you to just make some different resolutions this year. Maybe not the same ones that we make every year. Maybe it's not really just focused on us or our improvement or our physical improvements or any of that kind of stuff. But our resolution would be to grow spiritually, to walk closer with God. So I'll just throw out a couple of new resolutions for you just in case you need some suggestions. Start with what you already know. Wait for the Lord. Listen for the presence of of the Spirit, and then move and do something about it. Start with forgiveness in your heart. Repair some of those relationships that might be broken. And make time with Jesus. What would 2019 look like if you walked with Jesus every day this new year? Not ran ahead of him or thought we already knew what was coming, but waited for the Lord to move. What might be different in our lives? Our relationships, our language, our attitudes, our hearts. You know, a lot of us have best friends. Many of our best friends are our husbands or our wives. And I think about this. What would your relationship look like with those people if you spend as much time with them as you did with Jesus this past year? Have you spent enough time with Jesus? And if not, let's make a new resolution to grow with God this year. Love others. Do what you already know you're supposed to be doing. Our culture is so self-centered naturally that when someone is, is selfless and is living by that golden rule, walking closer with God, people notice that. And that gives us the opportunity to share our faith and to move and to take action with what the Spirit is doing in our lives. So what's broken in our lives today? What do we need to surrender to God? What do we need to bring to the Lord that needs healing and restoration in order to draw us closer to him? How will we be made new this new year? Do you want to be made new this new year? Will you embrace these new resolutions for 2019? 
You know, there is a saying that I heard that said, most people overestimate what they can do in a year, underestimate what they can do in a week, and procrastinate what they ought to do today. I urge us to not procrastinate our decision to allow God to make us new, to walk closer with the Lord, and to watch for what he's doing in our lives this new year. Will you pray with me?